We come now to the final segment of our overview study of the scriptures from dust to glory. And we come now to the section I think is one of the most exciting and fascinating and yet perilous sections of all of our study because now it's the glory part. We're entering into a study briefly of the last things of the future glory that God has prepared for his people and for his church. And we will be looking briefly at some of the major questions that come up with respect to the book of Revelation. Now, I mentioned a moment ago the idea of the last things, and we have a special subdivision in theology called eschatology. And eschatology focuses attention on the future. It is the science of the last things, things that are related to the consummation of the kingdom of God. And we deal with such questions as the parousia or the second coming of Christ. We look at questions like the rapture, the great resurrection, the manifestation of the Antichrist, heaven and hell, and uh, those kinds of questions are all uh, <clears throat> placed under the heading of eschatology. It's also an area where we find vast disagreement among Christians. It's one thing to interpret events from the past with some degree of consistency and acknowledged agreement and arriving at certain point of consensus. It's quite another when we're talking about prophetic material and we're trying to ascertain the significance of those prophecies. Now, the problem is compounded for us when we see that many of the prophetic predictions of sacred scripture are delivered in a literary form that is somewhat difficult to interpret. Where, for example, in the Old Testament we saw the apocalyptic literature of Daniel and Ezekiel, so in the New Testament we encounter the book of Revelation, which is called the Apocalypse, and the word apocalypse means a revealing or unveiling, but it takes its place in the context of highly imaginative language, language which apparently is intensely symbolical. Some people have argued, for example, that the book of Revelation was written during a time of severe persecution and that the author in seeking to communicate to his contemporaries who were struggling for their very survival in the midst of a hostile environment of political authorities that the book was actually written in code and the problem is we don't have the key to break that code with any absolute degree of certainty in our day Although I will say this, that the, this, the safest way to interpret apocalyptic literature, the safest way to interpret uh, the book of Revelation, is to study the images that we find in such books and see how that imaginative language is used elsewhere in sacred scripture because there is the tendency for consistency of usage in uh, imaginative language. Now, when we come to the book of Revelation, we see that, as I said, you have uh, this vast disagreement about matters of the future and of eschatology, and you've perhaps heard terms bandied about that indicate various schools of thought, such as uh, premillenarianism or postmillenarianism post post or awe, the awe millennial position and even in premillennial uh, theology there is historic premillennialism and there's dispensational premillennialism and even within the premillennial schema you have pre-tribulationists and mid-tribulationists and post-tribulationists you hear all these designations and some people get somewhat confused and befuddled by these various meanings. Now, a lot of those differences in systems of eschatology 
can be traced back to different views of the book of Revelation and different approaches to the book of Revelation. And I'm going to mention four in passing today. The four basic approaches to the book of Revelation, and these are not the only approaches, but the four basic ones that compete with each other for acceptance are what we would call the preterist view. The second is the uh, uh, future, futurist view. The third is the historicist view. And the fourth is the idealist view. Now these represent four clearly distinctive approaches to interpreting the last book of the New Testament. And briefly, the differences are these. The preterist view interprets the book of Revelation as basically having been already fulfilled in the past. It interprets the book of Revelation as dealing substantively with events that were near at hand and took place within the confines of the first century. Most chiefly, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD with the uh, dispersion of the Jews into all of the world. The futurist view sees the book of Revelation as a blueprint for a series of events that will precede the future return of Jesus. And so for the most part, the futurists believe that the things that are recorded for us in the book of Revelation have not yet taken place, at least from chapter 6 uh, through uh, the rest of the book. The historicist view, or the historical chronology view, teaches that the book of, General, uh, book of Revelation starts with its immediate concern in the first century with the local churches that had been established, but beginning at chapter 6 and going through the rest of the book, what we see is a pattern of a description of events that take place at various periods through world history so that you have a schematic approach to the whole of church history. And the fourth approach is the idealist view which sees that the book is basically symbolical and it talks about periods of conflict and resolution that take place all the time in the history of the church and the book is not designed to give us a chronology of specific events that will take place at specific times but rather to communicate the fundamental message of the triumph of the gospel and of Christ's kingdom in times of conflict and persecution. So you can imagine how one approaches the book of Revelation in one of these uh, uh, systems that will give a significantly different understanding of the message of the book. Now, as I mentioned earlier, with respect to the book of Hebrews, that one of the problems that we have with understanding the book of Hebrews is trying to determine who wrote it, to whom, under what circumstances. And having that kind of information at our fingertips can go a long way to helping us understand the message of the literature we're seeking to interpret. Now, in the case of the book of Revelation, there is a wide consensus that the book was written by the Apostle John and that he was the last surviving member of Jesus' apostolic core and that he lived into his 90s before he died. And so that's not so much the issue here, although his authorship of the book has been disputed in certain quarters. We'll leave that aside for now. The big question regarding the book of Revelation is, when was it written? Uh, and how we answer that question will go a long way to telling us how we're going to interpret the information in it. Now, again, scholars are divided on that question. And I could say that at different times in church history, the academic world reached a consensus, but then 
that consensus would be challenged and uh, that which was a popular view would fade into the background and another view would take its place and that would reach a consensus and but the consensus that we've had have not been long lasting but the traditional view of the book of revelation is that it was written somewhere between 95 and 96 AD very late in the first century now that's significant because if indeed it were written, uh, I shouldn't say were, if indeed it was written after uh, 95 AD or after 70 AD, that would at least eliminate one of the four systems of interpretation that we've already uh, delineated and that's the preterist approach to uh, uh, revelation, unless the author was engaging in fraud, writing of future events as if they were future, which in fact had already taken place. But you see, if the book was written in 95, it could hardly be forecasting or foretelling events that took place in 70 AD. <laughs> that would not, not be future prophecy at all. And now, in our day, there has been a concerted effort among some scholars to argue that the book was written much earlier than 95, and back in the decade of the 60s, perhaps in the year 67 or the year 68, some have even put it earlier than that, uh, in that same decade of the 60s, but in any case, the argument is that it was written before the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And incidentally, that date, 70 AD, for the fall of Jerusalem is one of the most well-attested dates that we have for any event in the ancient world. And so we can be fairly safe in assuming that it is a correct uh, 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 dating of that particular event. Now, whenever we look at questions of dating of a book of the Bible, we divide up the evidence into two kinds of evidence. And the two types of evidence that scholars look at could be called external and internal. External evidence deals chiefly with uh, testimonies from people outside the pale of the book itself, uh, people who are contemporaries or who live close to the time that a book was uh, written. And somebody might say, yes, I remember when uh, Philip wrote his letter back in 09. Now there we have an external reference to the dating of a particular document. Or we might find surviving from early church history, for example, documents that we know that were written in the second century and that these documents quote lengthy passages from the book of Revelation or make allusions to the book of Revelation. And if we know that that literature that, uh, that is quoting the book of Revelation was written in the second century, we know for sure that the book of Revelation was written before those books and not a third century document. That's the kind of detective work that scholars do when they examine the external evidence. The internal evidence for the writing of a document may be found where a person identifies himself and, and actually puts a date on it and said, I'm writing this in, in such and such a year. Or if a person makes clear references to events within the document that are known to have occurred at a certain period of time, that becomes significant in establishing the date. So without getting into all of the technicalia of that, let's just look at those two basic uh, uh, approaches to the dating of books. When we look at the book of Revelation, the chief external evidence not the only external evidence, but the chief external evidence that to which scholars have pointed historically uh, has to do with a reference made to the book of Revelation 
by the church father Irenaeus, who was one of the most respected theologians of his day. And Irenaeus makes a reference to the vision that John received on the Isle of Patmos. And he talks about this in terms that relate it to the reign of the Emperor Domitian, which would place the book in the decade of the 90s. Now, the only problem with that reference to Irenaeus, to which much weight has been given historically, is that there is some amb ambiguity in the language that he uses that leaves it somewhat of an open question as to whether he is saying that the revelation John received took place under the reign of Domitian or the person who received the information that he recorded in the book of, uh, uh, of Revelation was himself seen and known by the community during the reign of Domitian. Do you see the, the, the difference here? That uh, if, if, for example, John lived to be 95 years old, and suppose that John had his vision in 67 AD and recorded it, and then John himself lived till the reign of Domitian, then it could be that what Irenaeus is talking about here is the appearance of John during the time of Domitian rather than the appearance of, rather than the actual origin of the, uh, of the book of Revelation at that time. And that question has not been settled once and for all. But again, when we look at the internal evidence of the book of Revelation, there are other questions that emerge. Two or three things are very important to uh, interpreting the book of Revelation. One is the time frame references that are sprinkled throughout the book, of which there are several. But let me just uh, cite a couple to get you to taste uh, some of the difficulties that we have in dating the book. The book of Revelation starts with these words. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now, in that opening sentence or statement, two time frame references are made, neither of which is precise or exact but both of which carry a weight of a certain perspective with respect to time. First, John is told to record a vision of things which will shortly take place. Secondly, he makes reference to the time as being near. Now, these are not the only places in the book of Revelation that we find these time frames. In fact, there are many such references throughout the book of Revelation that have this message of urgency with respect to a time frame that is at hand, that is close, and that is nearby. Now, those who see the book as, as talking about events that still haven't, ta <coughs> that still haven't taken place will argue that that language refers to the rapidity with which things will come to pass once they start, but they haven't started yet. Or they might argue that uh, Peter tells us that a day in the Lord's uh, sight is though a thousand years. On the other hand, you have the higher critical scholars who have scoffed and ridiculed the trustworthiness of the scriptures 
because of time frame references like this and as are found in the Olivet Discourse of the teaching of Jesus when Jesus makes some certain predictions and said this generation will not pass away to all these things come to pass and the higher critics to, they don't shrink from saying Jesus was wrong and the Bible was wrong and that the prophecy of Revelation is wrong because it can hardly be said if this is all referring to 2,000 years or more from the time that the prophecy is given, how could you, in, in any stretch of the imagination, call its fulfillment something that took place shortly or was at hand or was nearby? That's the, that's the strength of of the preterist position that sees that the bulk of the material in here was addressing a crisis that was on the immediate horizon. Uh, the, the most significant redemptive historical action that takes place outside the New Testament is the judgment that falls on Jerusalem and by which judgment the Christian church now emerges with its own identity as the body of Christ. But in any case, that is one of the internal references. A second internal reference that uh, early date advocates have seen as being significant is the language of the book throughout talks as if the temple was still standing, which would be difficult to explain if the book was indeed written in 95 after this devastating destruction of the temple took place. A third, just to give you an idea of the difficulty that we face when we're trying to date and interpret the book, let me just give one uh, tough passage. It's found in the 17th chapter of, uh, of the book of Revelation. Verse 9, here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Now this is the kind of symbolism that you encounter. Uh, the, 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 the whore of Babylon is being addressed. The discussion of the beast and all. And we're saying, who is the whore? Who, what is Babylon? Who is the beast? What is the city of seven hills? Is it Jerusalem? Is it Rome? And so on. Because it doesn't say the seven heads or seven mountains on which the woman sits. It doesn't say the seven heads is the Roman Empire. There are also seven kings. Who are the seven kings? Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. You get an excedrin headache just with the images that are found in that couple of verses that I just gave. But you see, scholars look at that and they say, wait a minute. This must refer either to Jerusalem or to Rome. And some would take the position that the seven hills can only refer to Rome that Rome was the Babylon of that era, the one that was holding the people of God captive, and it is famous in antiquity for being called the city on seven hills. Well, it speaks of the kings, but the Romans didn't call their leaders kings, although there were plenty of references in antiquity to the Roman emperors as kings, even in the New Testament, when the Pharisees said, we have no king but Caesar. So even we find a reference in the New Testament to the emperors as kings. Then you go into the question of who is this king who now is? Now this is the kind of detective work that goes on. Five, there are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. So you have five kings presented in the past tense, one in the future, and one in the present tense. Now if you knew who that king was, and if he is future, I mean, if he is present, that would go a long way to helping you date the book. Now, there are different theories about that. But if the kings refer to the Roman emperors, and if you begin counting the Roman emperors from Julius Caesar, as most scholars of antiquity did, then you would get to the sixth king, or the king who is, would be Nero. And if the book was written during the reign of Nero, 
then, obviously, this would be a book that is concerned chiefly with events that are unfolding during his great persecution prior to the Jewish war and the ultimate destruction of Jerusalem. Now, again, I'm not saying that that is definitely what that means. I'm simply saying that's how we go about the process of trying to evaluate and analyze the internal and external evidence. And as you can see just from this, there are so many questions about the identity of Babylon, the seven hills, and the kings, and which king is to be numbered from which point that what we're doing here is the best detective work that we can do. But I hope that we will see in the time that remains that even though these different approaches to Revelation are virtually incompatible, and somebody is certainly wrong, even in that context we ought not to despair because the central message of the triumph of Christ and of his kingdom comes through so magnificently in this book that it has served as a treasure for the church from the first century to this day, giving the encouragement of God to all of those who suffer affliction at the hands of the enemies of God.